Hey, everybody. First of all, welcome. Beautiful day, beautiful venue. I got off really easy today. So uh, my whole spiel is going to be kind of informing and educating you about the basics of cannabis and how we got to where we are today. So super basic. Um, many of you will probably know some of this information, so we'll just uh, take it through one step at a time. So how did we get here? The question is really, where are we? You know, it, it, we're kind of moving towards legalization. We got all this cool stuff going on, but it's taken us about 90 years to get here. So for those of you that don't know, uh, cannabis was made illegal in Canada in 1928. So it's been literally 90 years. Um, there's, not a, there's a couple different theories as to why cannabis became illegal in Canada, and the most reasonable one um, seems to be that in 1922, the U.S. started to uh, make cannabis criminal, um, and Canada sort of just went along with what the U.S. was doing because that was the easy thing to do, and it kept everybody happy. So uh, historical references to cannabis in Canada really go back to using the plant as a windbreak around farmers' fields, and that's about it. So um, there's not a whole lot of evidence to support its use in Aboriginal communities or anything like that. So... Uh, other jurisdictions, that may have been the case, but in Canada, it was really a rarity until about the 1960s when it sort of came up, and we started to seeing it being a little more prevalent, and then it got really popular in the 90s, and that's when the usage rates sort of spiked, um, and that sort of bled into where we are today. So let's start with the basics of cannabis. We'll start with Cannabis 101. Um, Obviously, there's three types of cannabis. Most people only know indicas and sativas, uh, but there's actually a third type called ruderalis. We commonly refer to that as ditch weed. Um, sativa is what you'd see in a hemp field, so cannabis sativa lineus, or, uh, which was named for the, the botanist that found it, uh, is your actual industrial hemp plant. Um, and the primary differences between the two plants is sativas are very tall and sort of spindly uh, with very thin little leaves, and indicas are thick and bushy and short um, and typically, uh, you know, kind of like a you know shorter stature plant so what's the difference between the two you know common you know commonly in in sort of public knowledge people think that sativas are going to lift you up and make you feel more active and sort of you know attentive and want to clean the house and do all that fun stuff and indicas are going to put you to sleep and you know couch lock you uh, none of that is true we're going to get into why so let's talk about how cannabis is grown for a second. So obviously, uh, it goes through a whole bunch of different growth stages like any plant. We start with the seed. that you know We put that in the ground. That turns into a seedling. Then we get a vegetative plant. Then from a vegetative plant, we get a flowering plant. And that's where you start to get the buds off, the, off of the cannabis plant. And then we harvest it. So you know to quickly sort of outline the differences, uh, obviously, you know, seed and seedling, pretty self-explanatory. Vegetative plants are plants that are basically accumulating mass. So when you're working in commercial cultivation, you'll go into a grow room and you'll see a whole bunch of plants vegetating. And what that means is that the lights are on for more than 12 hours a day. So if the lights are on for more than 12 hours a day, chances are the plant's going to veg. If the lights are on for less than 12 hours a day, the plant is going to go into its flowering cycle and start producing cannabis. This is what you're going to get out of it. So nice, healthy looking bud there. You can see some nice red hairs. And that fine little white dusting you see all over it is actually the trichomes. So this is where um, the, the resin gland of the plant, this is where all the active ingredients are, and this is sort of the money of cannabis. <laughs> Two molecules exist within those resin glands, THC and CBD. Um, so THC is the champagne effect. That's the stuff that's going to get you high. We call it delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, and then we have cannabidiol, which is sort of the uh, analgesic anesthetic effect uh, that most people seek in medical cannabis. So really, you know, when you look at cannabis as an industry, the important thing to remember is, you know, we can grow cannabis, we can, you know, chop it all down, we can take that bud and we can sell the bud for, call it, you know, $4 and $5 a gram uh, to a provincial retailer. But if we actually grow that cannabis, take it, extract it, and take those molecules, we can get a lot more product out of one single plant. So to give you an example, if you were to take one gram of dried flour that was 22% THC, that would be about 220 milligrams of uh, THC within that actual bud. So that works out to about 22 standard servings of edibles. So one bud, 22 edibles. Uh, and you can see where the money gets manufactured from there. Now, 
Obviously, uh, it's a little more complicated than just two basic chemicals inside of the cannabis plant. There's you know, hundreds of different terpenes that all have different effects, and I mean this is a very small diagram, but essentially you can kind of get the sweet, spicy, sour, earthy tones between odor, aroma, and flavor. Um, and these are the sort of chemicals that will dictate whether or not a plant will make you sleepy or wake you up or do all of those other fun effects uh, that cannabis is responsible for. So you know, there's a school of thought that says beta caryophylline which which occurs in most cannabis strains, in high quantities will act as a sedative, and in low quantities will act as a stimulant. Whether the science backs this up, I don't know, but that seems to be where uh, things are going. So congratulations, you've now got the basics. You understand A, how cannabis is grown. You understand what the difference between an indica, a sativa, and a ruderalis. You know what a terpene profile is, and you know how licensed producers make money, whether that's growing cannabis or actually extracting cannabis and making infused products like vape pens and pre-rolls and brownies and cookies and all that fun stuff. Awesome, so now let's talk about the boring part. <laughs> cool, so these are the rules. So, um, like I said, Early on, 1928, prohibition started. Not a whole lot changed until 2001 with the introduction of the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations, or MMAR. And so the MMAR basically allowed patients to register with Health Canada under the reference from a specialist. They could then procure cannabis directly from Health Canada, uh, which was grown by a company called Prairie Plant Systems in a, an abandoned mine in Flin Flon, Manitoba, believe it or not. And then later on, about halfway through that program, I think it was about 2006, there was a constitutional challenge that said, you know, as a patient, I shouldn't be mandated to buy from the government. I should be able to produce this product on my own. And if I'm not able to produce it on my own, I should be able to designate someone else to produce that on my behalf. And ultimately, the Supreme Court of Canada agreed. So in 2006, roughly, we started to see designated grows, or DGs. So these DGs were under the MMAR program, and essentially it would allow a grower to either take prescriptions from other people and grow on their behalf or grow for themselves. And what ultimately ended up happening is we had about 35,000 medical patients in the country and about 3.5 million plants being cultivated to serve them. So ultimately gross oversupply situation and a lot of this gray market product sort of weaseled its way into the dispensaries over time and that's sort of where, how we got to where we are today. Now, with the MMPR in 2013, uh, it was a result of a constitutional challenge uh, created by a guy named Matt Murnau. Um, so basically, the MMPR allowed um, corporations to receive licenses from the government and to start growing and cultivating cannabis and selling it directly to patients. Uh, and this is where the cannabis industry in Canada really, really kind of took off. So this is when you saw the canopy growths of the world and the Afrias and the Auroras started coming out of the woodwork in these big, sophisticated facilities. Um, what was different between MMAR and MMPR, obviously, is the people growing it, but also the quality regime that goes around cultivating that plant. So instead of just, you know, setting up a greenhouse in my backyard and growing, you know, some weed for some friends and, and myself, now you're talking about a massive, sophisticated industrial greenhouse or growing facility with quality systems and sanitation and pest control and security and all of these sorts of uh, aspects around it. But well, the patients didn't like that very much. They didn't like um, that they had to buy their product from a company. So again, in 2016, there was another uh, uh, challenge, uh, which was the Allard challenge uh, to the Supreme Court. And that announced, uh, sort of brought into effect the access to cannabis for medical purposes regulations. Our bureaucrats are very good at naming things. Um, and that was in 2016. So what's the difference between MMPR and ACMPR? The big one is really that patients can now, again, grow for themselves. So they can take their prescription, they can submit that to Health Canada, they can get a certificate of registration, and then they can go ahead and start cultivating uh, at home. And likewise, uh, other patients can designate uh, the growers. So we're kind of back to the MMAR, but in a little more controlled fashion with the addition of private companies growing and selling cannabis as well. And then we just took the whole thing and threw it out the window with the Cannabis Act, uh, Bill C-45, which is the one everybody's really excited about. That's legalization. So we're sort of amalgamating all of these regs into one big bill, and that's going to come into effect on October 17th of 2018, and we can talk a little bit about what that looks like. So what if you want to get your license? How do we do that? 
So first of all, you have to apply, and then Health Canada is going to screen everything. So they're going to take a look at your application. They're going to make sure everybody's you know, honest. There's no criminals on your staff and your directors or officers or any of that stuff. And you know, if everything's OK, they're going to kind of push you along. Then they're going to conduct a review. They're going to make sure that all of the information in the application is accurate and compliant. Uh, and then essentially, you're going to provide them with an attestation of readiness to say that your facility's built, your security's installed, and everything's ready to go for you to receive your license. Once you've done that and Health Canada has approved, you'll get a license to grow plants. Doesn't mean you can sell anything yet, uh, but you can start growing. And after a couple cycles and proof that you're able to produce those plants in a controlled and safe manner, um, they'll come in, they'll give you an inspection, and then they'll actually give you a sales license. So that sales license then starts the process of you allowing to, uh, being allowed to sell to patients, um, as well as if you register with the CRA, get a second license, you can start recreational sales as well. And then you'll see one last step there, which is the license to extract which is actually a separate piece uh, of the sort of equation. I think it's a Section 53 exemption is what they call it, uh, and essentially it'll allow you to start conducting activities with blasting cannabis into extract, and that's what you'd use to make your edibles and things like that. So that's all coming along. Today, uh, you can only do food-grade oil with extract in it, so it'll get more advanced as legalization carries out here. So what are the results of this crazy licensing regime? Well. The big thing is that Canada has kind of taken the lead on the global stage for just what's possible. You know, whereas if you go in somewhere like the United States, you're going to find a lot more mom and pop type grows. You'll find like things like you know wooden grow tables in a grow room and just kind of some weird quality related issues, things that'll collect mold and dirt. Um, whereas in Canada, you'll find almost all the grows are built like clean room environments, so very filtered, very clean, uh, all sterilizable. So this sort of you know by creating this system where GMP standards and and you know all of these regulations are in effect, we've now created the kind of the finest, highest quality cannabis in the world, and that's really starting to garner attention on the world stage. So now we're starting to see Canadian licensed producers exporting to countries like Germany, Australia, the Cayman Islands, South America, and all sorts of fun stuff. So uh, it's going to get a lot more interesting over the ne next 12 months in terms of where we're going on the international front. And obviously, global opportunity. So you can see here on this map kind of where things are starting to happen. You can see a little bit of blue starting to show up down in Australia, uh, a lot of blue in South America, and you can start to see that blue spreading through Europe. Uh, as, and pretty soon, you're going to see it come down into Africa as well. So really, um, the tolerance for medical cannabis programs is becoming an international phenomenon. And what we've learned is, generally speaking, uh, recreational isn't too far behind a medical regime. So what's the next chapter? So the next chapter is really moving into crown distribution models, at least on the eastern side of the country, with the exception of Newfoundland. Uh, so essentially, in these uh, provinces like Ontario or Quebec, uh, licensed producers will sell to the liquor board, and the liquor board will handle distribution. Um, that will then go into their own, their own con liquor board controlled stores for retail. So essentially, you'll go into these uh, liquor board run stores, and that's where you'll be able to procure cannabis. Other provinces, you may see private operators where people can kind of open their own dispensaries, uh, but in a lot of those provinces, they're still buying wholesale through the liquor board. So the government is very much taking control of the distribution aspects of cannabis. And finally, where do we go from here? You know, cannabis uh, as a legal substance, I think, is a, is a really innovative thing, and it's really, really important. But uh, at the same token, if you look at Bill C-45, and especially when you combine it with Bill C-46, which is all of the impaired driving rules surrounding cannabis, the reality is, is that uh, as of October 17th, uh, we are now in a country that criminalizes cannabis more than it has ever done so in the past. So, you know, things that would have sort of been overlooked or sort of put under a summary conviction under the, you know, former uh, Cannabis Controlled Drugs and Substances Act uh, and those kinds of rules now become pretty um, serious offenses. So things like distributing cannabis to a minor comes with a 12-year prison sentence. So um, in a way, yes, we're going to have more freedom with cannabis than we've ever had before. Uh, but on the flip side of that, we have more criminalization of cannabis than we've ever had before. So something to ponder. And that's it from me, guys. Thank you very much.